And we are live. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us live or on replay. This is Fun With Film, the long-form video magazine that my co-host Paul and I, my name is Pascal, we prepare and produce for you just to make sure that we don't miss out on anything good from the small and big screen. Paul, it's been far too long. It's been far too long. This is um, this is we've been trying to film this for eight weeks, nine weeks now. It was supposed to go out December, November, December, and life got in the way. Life, um, natural events. I mean, short of an earthquake yeah. and tsunami, uh, everything conspired. But <laughs> uh, you know, we we don't give up. Very much like our heroes. And uh, this is a 2021 retrospective. I wanted to use also a French word in the title. So although we are recording and publishing this in February, you know, we wanted to go ahead with, with the plan of looking back at an incredible year where where people did go back to the cinemas where they could, yeah. but also we did spend quite a bit of time uh, in the house watching TVs and, and movies. I mean, literally, Paul and I have shared many, many film adventures, movie-based adventures, and this is just a very special thing to do to spend time with you, to just go through, you know, what we like about movies. We have a few segments, if this is your first time as part of Fun With Films, we're going to move on in a moment with Watchmen, more about this in a moment. We are going to talk about No Time To Die in Trailer Talk. We have the big question for you to know more about your, your co-host. We're going to go back in time and look at movies from the 70s, 80s, and even some time before. And we're going to ask you to take part in our Fun With Film quiz. I'd like to say as well, I think um, the retrospective for 2021 is very important because it has been the most challenging year for the film industry, I think, probably in their history um, since the founding of, of what we know as the modern film world. Um, and the fact that they've been able to produce some gems through the stream, streaming services and the big budget um, production companies and, and still turn out some absolutely cracking films with a challenging year has been fantastic. And we, we haven't been left hanging, right? So. Not, not at all. I mean, goodness, um, my watch list on my kind of Amazon Prime and Disney Plus is getting so long. I need to either clone myself or like another lifetime. Multiplicity. <laughs> Absolutely. Good movie. Very, very good movie. <laughs> So um, we want you to take part. So if you're watching us live or on replay, so if you're looking at the replay, you'll be able to fast forward to the different segments using the, the timestamp. But if you're joining us live, a couple of rules. Uh, keep the language clean because we could have families you know, watching this show and taking part in, in the replay. And this is about fun with films. We you know, can be critical, but let, let us be kind. As Paul mentioned a moment ago, you know, to actually make a movie and publish a movie is almost a miracle in its own right. So let's keep everything positive. What wouldn't we? Just like to put something out there as we have tried. <laughs> we've 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 entered into the filmmaking world and unless you've tried to do it, you have no concept how difficult it actually is to pull something off. Um, we did quite well in our first project, got a, a three-star award from the British International Film Festival, but it was blood, sweat and tears to get that right. So oh, um, it's very easy to criticise. It's very easy to um, pull something down, but until you try it, you have no real concept of how difficult it is. So be kind. Yeah, and we're here to celebrate the work of those incredible individuals and more. We are going to start by going down mm. what I call the Corridor of Dreams. <laughs> We're going to look at looking at the posters of things that you should be watching. The kind of thing you'd have on your bedroom wall when mm. you are 12, maybe. Let's begin with The Watchmen. <laughs> All, All right. right. So this is hammer, scissors, paper, or rock, scissors, paper to see who goes that first. One. We should do. We should do that first. So go, go, go. Ah. So I'm going first. 
which, which misses are the planned because I prepare, you know, I'm the producer. Well, you you won, so you could tell me to go first if that works with your plan better. You you get the choice. Absolutely. So this is about <laughs> what we've been watching, and we would like you to watch too. We are the Watchmen. I still think we should have had the T-shirt made with our logo at the end. Yeah. So I mean, we watch different streaming services. You know, we we've not been able to go to the movies together for quite some time. So we're going to start with your first selection, yes, sir. Um, Paul. From which service is that? would you say this is on netflix wow, um and it's one of there. their own produced in-house little projects and i kind of didn't know what to think when i saw the trailer for this i was really really dubious i thought it's going to be you know aimed at a much younger audience maybe i wouldn't be able to resonate with it and within five minutes me and my partner george just absolutely fell in love with this movie really yeah i mean it doesn't take long it's like boom from the opening credits of how they describe the catastrophe that has befallen the planet okay can you say was it a spoiler um it's some kind of alien Thing, <laughs> thing. With me. There is something on the wing that affects life on the planet. So let's just say, kind of insects will grow to the size of giant monsters, so giant millipedes, giant spiders, things. All things, the things we don't like, yeah. even when they are very small. Uh, some like hideous, nasty, monstery, bitey, killy things. But it, it's it's kind of a perversion of what we already have on our planet, and that that. It just wipes out most of the human race. Um, and from the tone of even how, it, from a storytelling and a directing point of view, they tell that little story in such a quirky, fun way. You get the whole vibe of what the show's going to be like. And it's just wonderful. It is so much fun. And you can watch it whether you are 10 or whether you are 110, and you'll kind of enjoy it the same. And it's, so it's a, a little bit family of, movie. Yeah. It's an everybody movie. Yeah. And it's just done beautifully. So a little bit of a premise of it. Seven years after the monster apocalypse, I think the Mr. Tricken should have called it apocalypse. Um, hapless Joe leaves his underground bunker to find his lost love, his girlfriend. So it is Dylan O'Brien from The Maze Runner. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. I thought I recognised the face. Yeah, he's brilliant in this. He is absolutely so much fun. Mm. You just... Likeable. He's like a young Tom, Tom Hanks. He's just so likeable. So he leaves his bunker where he's safe with a group of people. He's not on his own. He's got a, a network in this bunker. Mm. But basically he's hapless and he's kind of a nobody. He's scared. Do you know, that's an adjective that I should use more often. What? Um, hapless. Hapless, I'm, yeah. Like he's, he's hapless. He doesn't really know where he fits in, he's scared to go outside, he, he, you know, he, he's, he's not really the hunter, he's not really the protector, he's just a bit of like an odd job guy down there. And anyway, on a um, he catches on a radio signal, hints that maybe the girl he kind of fell for before this happened could be still alive. So he decides to take it upon himself to travel cross-country through all of these monsters and this world that has been left um, and it's the adventures. He meets up with the dog. You can see on the poster a little... Please tell me nothing happens to the dog. I'm going to tell you nothing happens to it. Good. Maybe something happens to the dog. <laughs> I'm going to tell him nothing happens to the dog. It's a little Australian Kelpie. I believe it was filmed in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other... His girlfriend, Jessica Hen Henwick, or Hennick, I think it is. She's from Matrix Resolution, Game of Thrones, The Force Awakens, Luke Cage. She plays Colleen... Wang in Luke Cage. Um, she's brilliant in this too. And we've got an absolutely amazing little appearance by Michael Rooker. Oh, yeah, there he is. There he is, right in the middle, just right, there right, yeah, with, yeah. The, with the hat. Seen, yeah. And he's with the girl, the young girl with the bow. And they've lived up there. So they, they, they have their little mentor to, to help him survive. It's so good. So, so well, good. You sold that to me. I wish Action, I had, I had fun. Netflix. Yeah. Beautiful. So well done. Um, this is 2021 retrospective, everyone. We've got a hello from Claire Taylor. So really, really pleased about that. I've Hi, got Claire. the uh, Facebook page open on my phone there. So every so often you see me keeping track of your comments. Please let us know. Actually, she'd love this. She, you, you'll, I you. can imagine, yeah. Let us know your top 2021 movies or TV series, and then we'll read them out as well when we go through I this. honestly think this is a hidden gem that just... it. 
it's so good it could have gone to the cinema if we'd had that and I think it would have done really well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So my first selection um, for 2021 Come is on. one that completely blew me away, Nomadland. Right, I've, I've not seen it. So two things blew me away. This is Oscar winning Nomadland. Chloe Zhao, the director, became the second woman in Hollywood to win an Oscar, which is obviously shameful. Um <laughs> After Catherine Bigelow, but th- there we are. Francis McDormand, of course, doing everything. But it was released on Disney Plus within moments of winning the Oscars. And I was just, I felt so like, this is incredible. You know, for the monthly fee that you put on Disney Plus, we get to. I didn't realize access, it was on there. Uh, access right. Disney Plus. Now, once you realize that the dis- distribution company is a touchstone, you can imagine that they kept it in a family. Yeah. Now, if you've not seen Nomad Land, I can only urge you to go check it out. And what I'm going to do is give you just a, a synopsis because I don't want to spoil the experience. Now, what you can tell from the poster there, Paul, and all of you, it, it's very minimalistic. You know, it's, it's a landscape. You know, um, we see obviously the sky takes a majority of, of the image. And you'll discover much later that it's the character played by Francis McDermott, who is just walking in this kind of um, twilight moment back to her camper van. And the story is about she has lost everything. She lost her husband to a a long illness. She um, has lost her house. She lived in a town in a city that has been essentially deserted by employers. And she literally, all she has is a big camper van. And she makes her way to a a meeting point where other nomads, modern day nomads, are supporting each other and learning to live. And it's essentially a um, a narrative around, you know, what's happening in in modern society where groups of people are being left behind. It's about poverty, but it's also about resilience. It's actually about humanity. And when you watch it, there's almost like a dreamline quality to it where you're just drawn into the story. It's not fast paced, it's not fast because sometimes, you know, the camera stays on, on that sunset for, for a while more things are happening. And then when you watch it and she meets the other nomads, I was saying to Denise, wow, those actors are amazing because they're so natural. And then, of course, you can't help it. You go on IMDb and you realize that these are real people. Yeah. And Chloe Zhao, the production team, and uh, Francis McDermott managed to essentially um, earn their trust and their confidence. And she literally, Francis, stayed with them and live with them because you say, if I'm doing this, I'm doing it properly. Yeah. And it's her story. And and you follow the story and you discover a, a side of um, modern life, which is um, incredible, but also how family members deal with her, uh, which actually to be more of a nomad as opposed to sledding down and so on. Um, so, yeah, I was just blown away that we got to have access to this um, Oscar-winning movie so early, and it's beautiful. I mean, nowadays with modern TV, you're going to get a full treatment. So Nomad Land is my first um, choice for 2021. I think this is the type of film that initially wouldn't appeal to a lot of people. But, you know, all credit to Fran- Frances McDormand is, mm. you know, you cast somebody like her, She's the type of actress that you can watch in anything, doing anything, and that's the point. You know, they've nailed the casting with her because she's absolutely brilliant. She she can sit and do nothing. She can sit and stare at a wall, <laughs> and she's interesting. You know, and yeah, I think that's that's that. a big a big draw for this type of movie. Uh, and you're right because there are moments which are all, they are almost meditative. You know, where she's sat outside drinking a coffee in her bathrobe, you know, hair, and then she just looks into the distance yeah. and, and you're just taken by that. So it's it's a visual experience as well as a, as a human one. I mean, that's a, a, a point for me is, I mean, I'm I, here's a spoiler about me. I'm not a big fan of Leonardo DiCaprio. I know okay. it's kind of sacrilege to say that. I, I really particularly don't like the guy, but he is amazing as an actor, so much so that the minute I see him in anything on screen, screen i can't stop watching it mm. and francis mcdormand's like that like her or dislike her or you know you, the, you we don't know these people i don't know leo or anything like that but it's not somebody i'm drawn to until i see them and yeah. they are so talented despite the fact i'm not drawn to them you'll watch them and you you that's, enjoy it they, they, that's a you wonderful know, that's a real, and observation real talent your second selection for the 2021 retrospective is this one. And once again, I've not seen this. Ah, oh, this is so good. This is Netflix as well. It's a Netflix produced the film. Red Sky. And they have taken so many cool ideas from other films, mashed it together, and done something that, in my opinion, should not work. 
and it, it's really? it's captivating from start to finish. It's a joint project between the US and Germany. Okay. German director, the lead actress, let's get her name right, Perry Baumeister, German actress. Um, they've put a few American actors in there, some Scottish actors in there. It was filmed in the Czech Republic and it still works. Mm. And they've, they've, um, they've just put it together so well. So you've got Dominic Purcell from Prison Break, the, yeah. the, the brother from Prison Break. Got Graham McTavish, who was Dwalen the Hobbit. Um, he was in Rambo, the SES yes, guy, he was, and yeah, yeah um, he's been in a lot of things. He's in it, little parts. So let's get to the the premise. Okay, so if you imagine it's kind of Die Hard, uh, Passenger Fifty Seven meets Thirty Days of Night. I mean, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So if, uh, a passenger airplane is hijacked. Um, by Dominic Purcell and his group. And he's not even the main kind of like cool bad guy in this. And he is always cool. But um, there's a German actor that plays like kind of the rogue hijacker that isn't quite to the rest of the guy's script. And he just basically wants any excuse to kill anybody. He's absolutely brilliant in this. Um, but on this plane, there's the mother... And her son, her job is to protect him. Now, the quirky twist is she's the vampire. Okay. And hence that reflection. That we can yeah, see hence the reflection there. in the mirror. And the vampires are very 30 days of night stroke Nosferatu. Um, they're not pretty looking. They are, <laughs> you know, bald, fangs at the front, pointy ears, like really feral. And... It goes into her backstory of how she became the vampire with um, having a son. And she's on her way to the States to have this revolutionary retreatment that I'm presuming will cure her. But she has to allow herself to turn to protect her son and protect the passengers on the plane. But then, does anybody else get infected on the plane? And, oh, my God, it's just brilliant. It's captivating from start to finish. Wow. And it, once again, that's the pleasure of watching Sold. it. Sold. <laughs> because, um, you know, you watch different things because you have to access yeah. different services. And, and, and likewise, I would have loved to have been in the, um, the first meeting when they, they presented the concept. Uh, because, again, kind of think, of course it's going to work. How come I've not thought of that before? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just so well filmed, so well put together. And acted you can't help i've never seen this actress before and she is amazing mm. from start to finish and the way they turn it where she is both predator and protector she has that battle as well you know and it, it's so it's so but good you're right though there are some amazing acting talent coming out of men in europe that we should know more about i've honestly found over the last um six months or so i'm watching more foreign films than Sure. You know, English speaking or US, and their the originality and the creativity mm. behind it seems to be well above what's coming out of the US a lot of the time. Um, it, it's it's fantastic. My Long second selection, continue. yeah, my second selection for twenty twenty one. I mean, there's so many, but um, <laughs> a mini series from Amazon Prime called Them. Yes. Oh my God! So this is like full on horror terror territory. Literally, even Stephen King praised it. So this, I think, it's got six to eight episodes. It's I've not a, even come across this. I've not heard of it. So one off. So the premise is a black family, husband, wife, and two daughters, moved to a white only neighborhood in the 1950s during essentially the breakthrough with discriminations and so on. And you would think that you know that would be troublesome enough, but then if you start to move into a haunted house, Ooh. where actually even the whole of the land is hexed, and even essentially the other residents, you know, from the white background, are also suffering from you know the influence of kind of nasty evil yeah. evil forces under, if you like, you know, with, with a backdrop of discrimination and and so on and so forth. And it's absolutely riveting, but like proper gets under your skin because this uh, character study of almost remember the um, the original Amityville horror where it, it 
it takes almost the two yeah. hours of the film for the, the, the characters to break down completely, but their journey from start to finish is actually quite heartwarming. Um, yes, it's about racism. Yes, it's about, obviously, um, lack of understanding and what prejudice can make people do. But there's also people who are just simply evil and forces from different yeah. planes and different dimensions. And when you watch the trailer, um, there, there's one of the daughters that, that was also in the movie called Us, which you may have seen. So, you know, you've got the trailer and it, it suggests that, you know, it's, it's a bit scary. And then the camera just, you know, zooms on her and with the kind of angelic, almost innocent voice, it says, there's something wrong with this house. <laughs> and bang, and you're, you're in it. And the, the, the directors and the editors have done an amazing job as well because <coughs> the opening credits are always a bit different. Sometimes they're actually quite modern, even though it's taking place in the 1950s. Mm. And it's challenging you really to, to watch a story that has been told before with uh, Mississippi Burning, you could argue, and many others, yeah. but done in a very unique way. This has been compared or been suggested that this was a ripoff of us or uh, Lovecraft County. I think that's very unfair. That's very unfair because actually it's different. It's just tackled you know, a similar subject well, matter. But the, um, the the style is very, very unique. And it's I mean, the comparisons are going to be there, but it, you know, it it sounds to me like it's got enough of its own legs to, to justify, you know, it, it's, it's talent and it, it's being made. And, and to me... There's not enough new interesting things and new interesting mm. takes on old ideas being done. And the more we arbitrarily put them down, the less people are going to do it, the less the, the big studios and the streaming services will take risks. The more we decide, mm. oh, well, we're, we're just not going to give that a chance, the more they're going to feed us the same crap we've we've had for 20 years and i, I think that sounds fantastic it, it is i mean and again it, it feels crafted you know it feels mm -hmm. someone that really put the time and effort into it and this descent into madness for all everyone not just his family yeah is quite something to um to, to kind of experience yourself as, as a viewer so i can't wait to see what you've chosen so this would be your third and final mm. selection for this segment watchmen uh, again, I, I don't know about this, so I'm, thank you. What is this? This is an exercise in a premise that, again, shouldn't work, but is so simple. It's kind of like how they're going to fill 90 to, 90 mm. to you know, 95 minutes. Um, basically, Melanie Laurent, who is phenomenal in everything she's in, highly watchable actress and everything in this film is on her shoulders because essentially for the most part it's just her she wakes up in a cryogenic chamber okay very futuristic looking mm -hmm. she doesn't know how she got there she can't quite remember who she is she's got very very fragmented fragmented memories and the oxygen is running out. Oh my, that's my. I, I yeah, oh yeah, yeah. God. So it's it's kind of ah. Uh, how can how can we put it? How can we put it? It is buried versus gravity, and she's trying to figure out. She's in this chamber. She's trying to figure out how she got there. What's going to happen? How she can save her oxygen? Is she going to get out? But she can't see out of the chamber. She doesn't know what's outside. Now, can she hear anything else? Or? Nope. Oh, God. She, when she's looking at the top, um, the chamber speaks to her, and it's got this kind of flashy lights as as it talks to her. So the, the 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 chamber itself will interact with her. So she's trying to work round the chamber's own uh, protective mechanisms to get out. And just to highlight that fact, when she starts kind of scraping away at the seal of the chamber. Uh, uh, an automatic needle comes out and tries to jab her and put her to sleep, you know. It's absolutely captivating. And the fact that it's just her in this uh, box for the... And I can only imagine that, very much like I was saying about them, you know, some of the angles some yeah. of the things they've, they've done. It's super, super creative. Um, the director, Alexander Ajar. Oh, well, she yeah, just said. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, from Switch. Blade Romance, mm. and um, he did the, the Hills of Ice, the yeah, remake which version. Which was really quite a, <laughs> something, you know. He's pulled off wow. a coup with this, and obviously during lockdown, things like that, 
you know, finding a way around the problem of not being able to film with many actors. And this whole thing is her in a box. Wow. Um, and there is scenes with other people, but Ooh, very, very few. And it's just in her memories. There's also... Oh, almost like a Joel's Game type thing yeah, going on there. Yeah, because yeah. she's got to figure out who she is, but she's also got to figure out how to get out of the chamber. But she's also got to figure out what's out of the chamber and is it going to be worse than where she is? It's brilliant. Oh, do you know what, Denise would love wow. this. Uh, did you watch it with Joe? No, I watched this while she was at work. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of the good stuff you know, yep. on your own. Can I just say as well, from the post, it feels like that there's some very clever thing done with light. Uh, it, am it's, I right? It's beautifully filmed, mm. beautifully lit, beautifully filmed. And my God, she acts her socks off in it. I bet, yeah. Really, Reminds really me, does. Uh, of course, you made the reference, you know, the one with Ryan Reynolds. Buried, yeah. It gave me nightmares for months <laughs> afterwards. You know. that, that, I think that that one, I mean, with age, I've become more claustrophobic than, yeah. than anything. And that would be just my... I opinion. believe as well, it's actually French language mm -hmm. in that she's speaking French, but it's dubbed over into English and it's her dubbing her own ah, voice nice. into English. That's nice when they do that. But it's so cleverly done. Unless you really, really look, you can't even tell. Um, and the other characters in it, she manages to connect via phone through the through the, the technology to somebody somewhere, not given too much away. Um, so she's able to talk to them, but it keeps going out of signal and and things like that. So obviously, the you know that's a way of segregating mm. actors, and it's just a voice on the phone. And oh my god, it's great. Once again, simple but you're making me regret not having Netflix. Now, elegant, but, uh, well done, superb choice. So, my final contribution to this segment of Watchmen. Once again, everyone, we're looking at 2021 and what we've enjoyed watching. We'd like you to watch it too. Don't forget to put also your suggestions in the comments. But this one was actually a very pleasant surprise, and you could argue it shouldn't be a surprise that Black <laughs> Widow was enjoyable. But here's the thing. I went through the whole kind of Marvel uh, universe, you know, movies, I think all 20, 22 of them, and actually watched them again via Disney Plus, and with, um, you know, Endgame cried again at the, all, all the right places and so on. So then Black Widow comes along and, um, you know, waited for it to be on yeah. the streaming services. And then I kind of sat there thinking, oh, well, if it's not so good, it doesn't matter because I've got all the other 2022 to enjoy. This was fantastic. And it almost made you remember how good the production team and director, you know, team are at creating stories with characters that you care for and you thoroughly engaged. Yeah. And and honestly, if you've not seen Black Widow uh, yet, any of you, go for it. And it's a wonderful treat because you get to know more about the character and the link superbly with obviously you know episode um which is infinity war is the one where she goes and rescue captain america and the others from prison they would be um yeah i think i think it's set between yeah civil war that's right yeah so there's, yeah. A, there's a moment where they, they link it and um you know I, I just loved it so i'm just quickly looking at, at my notes because I, I was so pleased with it i mean you've got to you know give it to um obviously um the fact that they had characters that only appeared in Black Widow that were not part of the universe yes. at all. But it didn't feel like it was shoehorned. So I have to confess, David um, Harbour playing Alex, yeah. it, just, it, it was hurting. It was Again, almost like, he, uh, he's never bad as he's uh, always good. And playing almost like uh, a proper dad yeah. fi uh, uh, figure, for, for sure. And then Rachel Weisz, who must be obviously immortal. She must have a yeah. um, portrait in the attic. You know what it is? I miss her as Do an you? actress. I mean... Obviously, she's kind of been chosen not to do much over the last few mm. few years, and I, I do miss seeing her. Uh, Constantine, I recently rewatched. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll uh, have a look at that. She's so, brilliant. So, so for me, it, it was just um, wow, a, a great addition to um, to to the to the Marvel universe, and as opposed to somewhere you can go, well, I'll skip. And it's not going to uh, do much. Some of the actions, some of the set pieces, and again, the training that they must have gone through, all of them, yeah. to pull to pull this off. Um, it was great. And the story was very clever. And I really, really enjoyed following the, what was happening. It, it felt a bit like we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, a James, James Bond-like yeah. mission. 
And um, yeah, it, it was really good. And once again, uh, I have to say that um, I'm sure you're very pleased with Netflix. I'm very pleased with Disney Plus yeah. and what they're pulling off at the moment. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Scarlett in anything. Mm. She, she She's very, very talented. But I do love um, the Black Widow character. And I think, you know, she, she's very grounded. She doesn't particularly have any superpowers. So her and Hawkeye could very easily easily have been the poor cousins in the Marvel universe and, yeah, yeah. and marginalized and not really given the screen time to the, the Hulk and things like that. And she is just cool as all hell, you know, <laughs> and she's brilliant. She, mm. She's brilliantly port- portrayed. She's a brilliant character. And um, I, I love, um, in fact, she's one of my top three Marvel characters in the MCU and I just think they've done so much justice with with her all the way through. Um, the 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 sister, yeah, in it as well. It's lovely seeing her get some more roles. She's done some cool things in the past. An English actress, yes, well yes, done. You want those. Um, if you haven't seen Fighting with the Family that she's in, it, highly recommended. Mm-hmm. True story. Um, it, it every single person in it is very talented and cast really well. That That's my big takeaway from this movie. There wasn't one miscast. That's right. And and for me, it was more this idea of, although the, you know, they have they are done with the main story, yeah. this is not a cutting corner. This is not an afterthought. This is a movie who's given the same treatment and the same level of care and attention as all the others, which is to, to their credit. Um, we've got a hello from Denise Vintoni as well, watching us live. So... This is lovely. Don't don't forget to put it in the uh, in the comments. I keep checking on the phone. Your 21, 2021 top movie. So this will be our top three. So we've got six now uh, mm-hmm. all together. But well, there may be some that could have made the list. Uh, oh before. my you, god! You, you want so to many. mention very briefly. So many. Go on then. Uh, I mean, I have a <laughs> list. I'm talking about a list. So if anybody's saying we didn't have anything, right? Boss level. Okay, yeah. With Mel that. Gibson and um, Frank Grillo was Groundhog Day meets some kind of crazy mad cat action film, but that, that was brilliantly done. Um, space Sweepers, which is a Korean saw that, yeah. space... I, I saw the, um, the, the post about yeah, us in the film. Epic space film, which is um, just got robots, got this guy. It's just quirky, and it's really well made. Obviously, Dune... Um, but bum, bum free guy was pretty cool. Finch with Tom Hanks, very good movie. Very jealous that he saw um, that. Um, Prisoner of Ghostland, don't know that with Nicolas Cage. Oh, oh no, I'm gonna know the cowboy yeah, yeah. samurai horror. <laughs> God knows what it is, but it's just brilliant. Um, Venom, Let There Be Carnage, Ghostbusters Afterlife, obviously, The Last Duel. With Ridley Scott's The Last so, Jewel. I saw that on Disney+. Uh, that's was pretty cool. Yeah, was now, with it. Halloween Kills. Not seen that. I absolutely loved it. A lot of people, it's it's divided audiences. A lot of people didn't like what they'd done with it following the last Halloween film. I, th- I think both of them are great movies, and I can't wait for the third part. One that really got me. Now, here's another one that I don't like the actress very much. The film is brilliant. Till Death with Megan Fox on Netflix. I've not seen that, right. So the premise of, premise of this one is she's not a very nice person. You think her husband is. She goes away with her husband for a little anniversary treat. He knows what she's been up to. And they're in a cabin in the middle of the snowy wastelands, nothing there. And he kills himself and handcuffs himself to her. Okay. So she's stuck in the middle of nowhere, handcuffed to this body, and he's set up the whole house so he's got rid of anything that she could break the handcuffs with because he drugs her. Um, And he is arranged for two villainous, nefarious types to turn up at the house and kill her. Can she escape before they get there? It's it's fantastic. And she's brilliant in it. She nails the performance and has put so much effort and so much work into it. Again, it was like that Leonardo DiCaprio mm. thing. Uh, within five minutes, I was like, you know what? Actually, 
I'm changing my mind. It, it's such a good movie. Um, Underwater on Disney Plus. Have you watched it yet? Yeah, yeah very good. Oh, wow. If you like The Abyss and Le- yeah. Leviathan, yeah, watch it. Yeah, a bit it. of uh, Colour Cthulhu going on in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wheel of Time, the series, I thought was brilliant. Uh, another one that divided audiences, Cowboy Bebop on Netflix. Yeah, I... I've heard they're not going to go ahead with the second yeah. season, which I the, think is a they've shelved, real shame because I, I really enjoy the animated series. They've shelved the second season, and I think it's one of those things where some of the people that were fans of the animated series have got on Twitter and said, you know, we don't like the changes you've made and blah, 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 blah. You know what? If you just watch the show and enjoy it for what it is, the amount of work and effort and creativity that have gone into it to make it what it was... It's a real shame because they're going to stop making these shows that push the boundaries if people don't give them a chance. And I've got a funny feeling Cowboy Bebop will be another Firefly in a couple of years. Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. will lament not giving it a chance to build the world because it could have been amazing and it was very good anyway. Um, Cop Shop with Gerard Butler... Frank Grillo is mm-hmm. absolutely brilliant from start to finish. Army of the Dead was good. The follow-up, Army of the Dead, mm-hmm. Zack Snyder's... It wasn't good. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty good. The follow-up, Army of Thieves, mm-hmm. is so much better. All right, where you go then. Basically, the, the German safe cracker, mm-hmm. his character is a prequel. He directs it too, Matthias Schoenart. Right. He directs it too. It's fantastic. So funny, so quirky. Um, Beckett. It's a good movie. I know this. Um, John David Washington, Denzel Washington's son. Basically, set in Greece. Him and his girlfriend, they have an accident. Tragically, something happens to her. Then all of a sudden, the police are trying to kill him. Why? And he's been chased through Greece Trying to find out uh, why. I've seen the trailer for it's that. It's great. Oh, well done. Yeah. So, yeah. so good. Werewolves Within. It's brilliant. On the watch list. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. It's so fun and quirky. It is Ten Little Indians or, you know, that kind of um, whodunit, knives mm. out style whodunit, but one of them is a werewolf. And it's <laughs> so fun. It has the tone of maybe some of the torn down... Um, uh, it's it's like Haunted Honeymoon. It gives me the feeling of Haunted Honeymoon. It's got that kind of humour to it. it. It's it's great. And last one, I would say Kate. Um, yes, good choice. Which is a, an assassin movie on Netflix. And it's uh, beautifully filmed. Really well done. I know we've kind of seen it all before and there's many different iterations However, of them. Like you said, it was really well done. But it's yeah. probably the best of a bunch, really. Mm-hmm. There you oh. go. They're my top picks. Okay. Uh, for me, very, very quickly then, Fast and Furious 9, mm-hmm. which actually was a blast. It was very, very good. I mean, Better than just, Hobbs and Shaw. Um, actually, I didn't mind that one mm, so much. No. Yeah, it's quite it's all right. No, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, you have to sometimes close your eyes and mind and literally switch off the brain yeah. to get to go on with that one. But uh, I, I love John Cena in, into it and the yeah. character. And there was a little, you know, moment at the very, very end. If you, if you kept watching, which was very special, uh, you mentioned Oxygen uh, yes. earlier. Shadow in the Cloud, an Amazon Prime special. It's the same premise, but this time a young lady is stuck in that kind of um, gunner turret, the, the bubble turret of the um, 1950s. Yes, I've s- yeah. Um, and oh. oh I say no more. It's uh, Chloe Grace Moretz, isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah right. that's on my watch list. Amazing. She's talented. Um, similar to Kate and the others, The Protégé, yep. um, which was released recently. It's very um, good. Those Who Wish Me Dead, which was very, very, oh very good. So, um, What was that? The, the, the premise is is around um, yes. firefighters yes. and rescuing a, a young lad who is being that pursued. Is it, that is a good movie. And, um, I've got Jungle Cruise, which was a good you know, family mm-hmm. entertainment. And I've got also the three-part documentary Get Back, the Beatles, the Beatles. Um, rehearsing for their last performance on, on the, the rooftop, and, and, and a few more in there. But um, that's Peter Jackson, isn't it? Who did Peter that? Jackson, who re-rendered uh, the, the 1969 footage, yeah. and it was just completely. Wow. Uh, I was enthralled because I'm thinking, am I actually hearing the Beatles? 
you know, the, the famous four, chatting, rehearsing, eating toast and drinking tea. And I, it was just you know, remarkable. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the emotions go up and down as they're trying to create an album and have a concert in the space of four weeks. So I think I, the thing about that as well is you don't have to be a Beatles fan. I think that's the the thing that Peter Jackson has managed to pull off is you don't have to be a fan of the band to get engaged in their story. No, completely. So this was a, a fr- you know fraction longer than usual Meh. for Watchmen, but hey, yeah, we don't watch the, the clock. This is our long form video magazine, long form format. This is twenty twenty one retrospective. So once again, in the comments, your kind of uh, highlights of last year in terms of movies and um, TV series. Talking of highlights. Let's sit down. Let's get comfortable. Let's tell people behind you to stop kicking the chair. <laughs> yeah. And let's move on to trailer talk. <laughs> All right, we mentioned a moment ago. We're going to talk about No Time to Die. At the time of recording this, we are beginning, well, we the world is beginning, the celebration of 60 years of Bond. This is incredible, starting in 1962 with... Dr. No. Dr. No, indeed. Yeah. And this film, in fact, makes a little reference to quite a few of the Bond classics. The very last one with Daniel Craig, No Time to Die. Shall we watch the trailer? Yes, yes, please. Go. Love it. <laughs> James, fate draws us back together. Now your enemy is my enemy. How did that happen? Well, you live long enough. Harder to tell the good from bad, villains from heroes these days. We used to be able to get into a room with the enemy. Now they're just floating in the ether. Did you know that? What is it? You don't know what this is. Is she one of them? I don't know her at all. When her secret finds its way out, it'll be the death of you. James Bond. We both eradicate people. To make the world a better place. I just want to be a little tidier. I met your new double O. She's a disarming young woman. Have you ever flown one of these things before? Nope. Do this, there will be nothing left to say. When you're ready, you're late. Can I just have one nice evening, please, before the world explodes? <laughs> I mean, how long did we have to wait till it eventually you know, came out? You're right. I mean, My this God, was three um, years or something. We shelved three times. Three times to try to do, um, you know, the, the release. They missed actually last year, 2021, celebrating exactly 15 years of Donald Craig being born, starting 2006 with Casino Royale. But actually, what 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 they they, they, did, they did get there, and now, I mean, this movie. Um, well, the, the Blu-rays and DVDs are selling like hotcakes. Was the number one yeah. Christmas present uh, on Amazon? Um, well, I got it for for Christmas, which is why I watched it with, with Denise. And we just mentioned a moment ago during the introduction that because we're not seeing each other for some months, we exchange Christmas presents. And what did I get yep. you? Bond. <laughs> I love it. 
Did you enjoy it? Yes, yes, I did. And it is definitely one of those movies that has polarised audiences, um, rightly or wrongly so. And <clears throat> I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, personally. And, you know, Daniel Craig had said he was never going to do another Bond film after Spectre, the injuries he'd he'd sustained. And I think he was just kind of done with the character and wanted to do new things anyway. So to get him back to finish the story, I, th I think they've had to give him a lot of input into this. And, and again, rightly so, he should. So uh, I think this story was the way he would have wanted to go out and we have to respect that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's his era as much as it is a filmmaker or, you know, a character. It's his era. He's done so much blood, sweat and tears for this franchise, for our entertainment. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, he deserves to to go out the way he wants to go out. That's the way I see it. And we can we can have our opinions like it or not. Yeah, and, and we mentioned that, you know, this being fun with films, Paul and I would always err towards positivity and yep. actually praising people. Um, because ultimately, with respect, it's just a film, you know. Uh, I've seen yep. people put on, put on Twitter, I've seen the blogs and so on, and I think you just need to just, um, you know, take a breather and just realise that, you know, people do the very best. But for me, what was brilliant, for the first time ever in the Bond franchise, there were five stories that were linked to each other, as yeah. opposed to in the past, which you know wasn't a problem to me. You know, there was a mission after the mission, yeah. and every so often, um, someone like Blofeld or Felix Light, or whatever, would come back. But actually, there, there could be some pleasure now, if once you've seen No Time to Die, to go back to Casino Royale and yeah. work your way through because the it's one with, story. It is one story. The yeah. thread with Mister White, with the, with the daughter, and so on and so forth, is just just um, amazing. Can we just say that this movie looks beautiful? It it's stunning. The cinematography and the lighting, as as we discussed earlier on, should be up for an Oscar. It, mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Well, interestingly, the the BAFTA nominations were out yesterday. Yeah. Um, essentially, you know, achievement in filmmaking is one. Uh, editing is one. I I mean, so this is next month the BAFTA, the time of recording, and a few weeks later is the Oscars. It feels to me that uh, if anything, this movie should get the Oscar for. The, the look and feel, the design, the sound, because when I watched it, I put the sound bar on full because yeah. we're lucky enough not to have the neighbours next to us. And you could see, you know, the way they use the 4K cameras, the 60 mil cameras, and also the, the sound. The, um, that, yeah, uh, I regret yeah. not being able to go to, to the cinema, just couldn't, couldn't make it, but I'm so pleased to have that Blu-ray alongside all the other Bond movies. So let's get into the, 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 the crux of it. I, because this is a retrospective, most people have very probably seen the movie mm. now. So let's have a little think about what did we like, what did we dislike, what would maybe we have done differently, which I would just like to say, creating something unique is a lot more difficult than criticising something after you've seen it and seeing what you would like <laughs> to change. That's easy. I, I that's, that's my skill. I'm very good at taking a project um and go on actually if we tinker with that it would be better that's i i'm good at doing that but actually making it in the first place is 50 times more difficult so mm -hmm. let's have a little you know tongue-in-cheek what did we like what were the points oh, for me what gave me goose pimple were the nods to particularly dr no as we understand yes and on her majesty's secret service the way they weaved you know that very unique soundtrack we all know and the, the Bond theme. And I just felt that I was being looked after um, as a fan. And I just put that visual for you, Paul. I love actually the cohesion and the thread between the different characters and how it all kind of works. And um, But also this idea of actually <coughs> a, a, almost like a doomed character in you know, a Bond. I was saying to you in the green room yeah. before I go, can't catch a break. You know, he's, he's just asking for a, a slice of life, like everybody else, where you can just stop for a moment, uh, you know, be loved, love somebody else. And, and get on, and, and of course, you know, things have happened, you know, in, in the past, and sometimes in the distant past, it's forever catching up with him. It's also, he's carrying the weight of his profession, mm -hmm. and his job, and the expectations of his country on him to just be a blunt instrument. He was a blunt in instrument, but the character in these movies has never wanted to be 
He's always wanted to be something more. Mm. And that's a story that's never been told. Essentially, Bond in the past was happy to just kill. Didn't give a monkeys. Water off a duck's back. I don't care if I kill that person or this person or that person. I have no emotions. I'm just a caricature of a human being. Whereas now the Daniel Craig portrayal is how would carrying that kind of weight really affect you? And it's on his face. It's in his demeanor. (sighs) It's how he carries himself. It's in every interaction with every other person in that film. Look at his face on that poster. Mm. That, that's acting right there. He doesn't have to say a word. You know what he's gone through. Absolutely. It's, it's in him. And I think that really is something that has never been done with Bond before. And I think that is beautiful. Let me show you a different visual to get your okay. reaction. Only because I actually I kind of know what you're going to say. But can we agree that um, it was so nice to see that car? Yeah. Even though it got trashed. Obviously, yeah, I mean. For the whole sequence in Italy. And that, beyond the, yeah, yeah. that for me was, it, it, they've been very clever in that each sequence of the film has a lighting and tone that will take you back to earlier films. Mm. And that whole scene of riding along the coast in Italy and, you know, the Aston Martin, um, oh, wow, that took me back to that kind of late 70s, early 80s era of Bond films. It was lit in the same way. It had that feeling. It had that romanticism. It had that, oh, my God, I could never afford to do those kind of things, which, you know, Bond lived in a world of tuxedos and casinos and hobnobbing with people you would never do it 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 Mm. gave you that feel it gave you the the average person that's bond it took me back to that era before anybody had even opened their mouth and that scene where they're in the car in the square and that they're shooting at the windows and bond's just been stubborn as all hell and um yeah it, it was fantastic i mean i think in that uh, bond movie they've used every form of transport uh, yeah. imaginable, imaginable. We saw a lot of it in the trailer. And the next visual I wanted to, sh- to share with you, just to kind of trigger your your, your memory, is um, and this one, and it's just once again about the photography, about the set design, everything, where people have, have applauded almost, you know, circling back to Doctor No. But actually, yep. fans have um, studied No Time to Die and have found hints and little nods to all previous twenty four, which I think is remarkable. And that's something must have been delightful for the filmmakers to do that yeah i mean it's absolutely contrived and deliberate and they've taken the opportunity not just to tell a story but to put so many little easter eggs in there for you know nerd fans like (laughs) like we are um to go oh my god that's off this oh my god that's the and to take the time to do that is is brilliant for the fans it's it's fantastically done and again, if you look at his demeanour there, you look at his body position, it's dogged, mm. but determined. Mm. Um, you know, he's hurting, but square the shoulders, Do stiff you know, upper lip. One thing about Bond, I could not look that good with braces. I, I, know, <laughs> I, know, I know this, you know. So for me, the, you know, what, what I loved about this movie in particular... Daniel can pull it off. Yeah, he he can pull it off. Anything. This guy is, is incredible. <laughs> Can I just say as well, you know, when he was interviewed um, following the, the, the launch, he was so relaxed, wasn't he? He was so chatty. Was He's also really so de- self-depreciating. Mm, yeah, yeah. It, it's fantastic because, I mean, the guy's a, a good actor, great actor. He's in fantastic shape. He's, he, you know, he, he's got the job of a lifetime, but he plays everything down and he's so humble and so nice and... Yeah, uh, I'm I'm just a real big fan of him. Absolutely. Now, can we agree that the sequence in Cuba is yes. just outstanding? Th- this is one of my um, things about the film. In some ways, after that sequence, the rest of the film was poorer for me. Uh, and yeah, it, yeah. It was, it was such a. It was one of those yeah. moments where you kind of go right. You know. I, yeah. I I don't dislike the film in any way, and I've I've gone back and watched it a second or a third time, and it's better on the second and third viewing because you know you, you don't have the expectations mm. of what you want it to be or where it's going to go. But this sequence, when they go to Cuba, the lighting changes, 
um, with Paloma played by Ana de Armas, who was handpicked by Daniel after Knives Out. Mm. And again, she is good in everything she's in. The chemistry between between the two, the way they play the action, the set pieces, she pulls off the action like nothing else. Um, it's it's quirky, it's fun. I just wanted the rest of the film to be about these two. Yeah. Um, and if that's a story they'd told, it would have been amazing too. And I kind of didn't want to go back to the story. I just wanted these two to go off and have some it kind does, of adventure. It does feel like a very, very special moment in, yeah. in the film. You're right, that light everything. And and the humor, I remember, you know, I was uh, kind of giggling and chuckling, and so was Denise, because actually, yeah. whilst it is complete carnage in there, and I don't know who's going to pay, you know, I hope they're well insured. And also the, the setup, you know, because um, there's a moment where Bond is obviously spotted, and it's all a bit sinister what goes on. You yeah. know, not much later why uh, someone is, is, is talking to him and so on. But yeah, I, I, I would agree. And um, so to me, that was a standout moment. But um, one thing that... I, I so hope to do a spin-off with her character. <laughs> yeah, but, Please, because, you know, what I liked, it was so good. Yeah, what I liked about it was, you know, the, those characters as well and the role they played in pushing the, the story forward. And, and there was something actually comforting to see them back and then hopefully have new characters as well. But it was the first time that we had longer sequences of people talking about Bond and being torn between being supportive and trying to obviously you know, help him out and being critical and saying, is it time for him to just move on and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I thought that was really well done. One thing I did like is that you do see these people as people. For the first time, you see they've got lives, you see they've got morals, you see they're just, to a degree, doing a job, a job that has to be done, a very important job, but it's their job. Um, and they have conflicts as well. Yeah, are, yeah. Are, are they going to help James and go against M? Are they going to support M? Are they just going to put their head down and get on with their day? Um and that's never really been explored because it's always just been about the adventure, not about the characters or the people, you know? And I think that is something moving into the modern world of filmmaking that should be done. And that, you know, the, the making more TV series is these days mm. where that's a t the type of story they're telling in the series is because they've got more time. They can flesh it out. But over the course of the four films, have been able to do the same and, and introduce the characters as as people, and you can relate to them, you can resonate to them. Um, so I think you're well right. written. It, it would be a pleasure to go back to Casino Royale and see the evolution. Now there was one character that I was delighted yeah. to see again. Oh, I mean, is that Felix remarkable? is brilliant because it, it, it's not. Uh, I mean, if you look at the, the amount of time he's on screen, it's not a lot. But yeah. he has an impact every single time because is it the only brother in arms, really? The only kind of confidant and someone yeah. you can trust left in Bond's life. And just that little scene with the coins <laughs> in their hand where him and him, Bond and Felix are, are playing this little game with the coins, that says everything about the two of them. You don't see Bond acting like that with anybody else, even the love of his life. But you see it between them two. They're that close as people, as friends, as brothers in arms, as people that have shared time in the trenches. They have that bond, the soldier's bond. Mm. And it's brilliant. And the fact that, you know, Bond doesn't necessarily win. <laughs> you know, Felix is the smarter one of the two in this particular <laughs> instance. Yeah. Again, makes it a little bit more real. We know that Bond is super, super capable in all things, but he's not perfect, and and that's something that is shown in in Daniel Craig's era, um, Brosnan's era too. Pierce brought that into the franchise mm. for sure, but it, it's really explored that he's he's fallible and he is not perfect and he is human. Let me just show you this. Dun dun dun. <laughs> right. Um. Uh, one of my other bugbears is he was underused to the point where he actually needn't have been in the film and they could have just fleshed out the story with Blofeld and finished off the full four well, I think, character arc with Blofeld. I think they got themselves in trouble with Spectre and it was almost yeah. like, you know, oh, 
crap, you know, what do we do now? Because yeah. um, when we, we've spoken about it, I, th- I was disappointed with, with Spectre because yep. I thought Blofeld should be the ultimate nemesis and they should have gone elsewhere with a story. But we are where we are. Yeah. And, and I think, um, so they had to find something. I mean, Christoph Waltz is so good that it was brilliant having him in mm. at all. It would have been horrible to have left him out and, and just had Rami Malek, who is also a genius, but Christoph Waltz is so good. That scene with him and Bond, you're just hanging on. I want more. I want more. I want more. And they could have used that and they could have maybe introduced Rami Malek's character, Safin, in the credits or at the end or in some way so that he was coming next, mm, you know, mm. because he was so underused in this film. He was so good. He's such a creative actor. He's so watchable. And the character itself of Safin had so much legs to it to to see him come and go so quickly was almost a shame. And, and again, that's a credit to the movie itself. It's a credit to the actors and it's a credit to the writers that you want both of these villains to have more time. <laughs> you do, yeah. So, so we end up with a situation for, for fans and you know for people who enjoy the story where we wanted more of Blofeld and we wanted more yeah. of him. And we got something in between. In between, where, yeah. Which wasn't satisfying because I have to say, yeah, um, I mean, I will watch Spectre again and I would enjoy it probably because now, as you mentioned a moment ago, there's less expectation. But it's like, come on, you know, it's, the, it's like um, you know Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty. Yeah. You've got to go uh, all in. You can't kind of um, hold back. What I will say is some very interesting twists and turns and some reveals in that movie that you know, if you let go and go with a story, there's some moments where you kind of go, oh, I see. No, I didn't realise that. Yeah, and, I know where you're um, going with this. What I like about it, you know, the, the whole movie is the, well, there was three attempts at releases, therefore there was a very, very long marketing campaign. There was probably three to four different trailers, featurettes, behind the scenes, being Bond documentaries and so on. And somehow they managed, just as we have, they managed to keep the storyline and not spoilers, really. Yeah, and I, th- I think respectfully so. Um, and... You know what? It was ballsy to put this film on hold for so long. Quite. You know, very little cannot get out in Hollywood or this, that, and the other. That you know, it was more more chance of revealing the end of the film than not. And they stuck to the guns. Nope, it's going to go at the cinemas. We're not putting it on st- streaming services until it's been there. Everybody's waiting, 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 and then bump. They dropped it when they could at the right time and deservedly so people went and i would i would think the majority of people uh, loved it uh, you know it, it has it it has its people that are detracting for whatever reasons mm. but i think they've done a fantastic job from start to finish it's an amazing adventure action movie you know and, and i think it's lovely that it's very symbolic you know the 25th yeah. one 60 years of bond and so on uh, i can't wait to see what they're going to do next. And I th- maybe that's how we could wrap up, you know, this amazing trailer talk. I've enjoyed it so much. Did you have, or do you have a preference? Do you have a guess into what it might do with number 26? So without spoiling anything, what did you think of the end, first of all? Oh, I think it was, um, well, I was very emotional. And the reason I was very emotional because I just mentioned a moment ago, the symbolics of, you know, 15 years with Daniel Craig. Yeah. Um, 25 movies, 60 years, there was everything in there, but also the way in which they were so respectful of the heritage that there was links with Honor, Her Majesty's Secret Service, Doctor yeah. and all that kind of things. And I kind of went, I, I, I was like, oh my God, this is such a brave ending of a very brave yeah. five-part story. We're going to take a breather and then something new is going to happen. Yeah. What about so you? you were positive about it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was gutted, but I was positive. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of how I felt. I was kind of like, oh, my God. I, I knew it was coming. I, mm. I, I'd figured it out. There was no spoilers or whatever, but I pretty much knew it was coming and that the reason Daniel Craig will have signed on will have been to to have some kind of finish and closure to this, this story. Um, me, I didn't want it to happen, but I understand why yeah. and I understand the need and I understand the ballsiness of it. But the one thing I will state is it doesn't come across as a gimmick. 
let's just Very do true. this for the sake of shock factor or blah, blah, blah. To me, it came across as a natural conclusion to this particular person's story. Now, how and which way they're going to move on after this is very, very much up for debate. Um, do you have any theories or anything uh, you would like well, to happen? Well, I have one uh, theory, only because um, practically they're going to hit that problem all the time, which is it's it's a long slog to be a, the Bond character. Right, 15 years, you know, you, you mentioned when you age, you get injuries, you, you have other ambitions in life and so on. And I wonder whether, similar to what they're doing in other franchises, they're going to start much earlier with essentially a younger James mm-hmm. Bond who is not yet uh, licensed to kill, so to speak. And and then they may have a longer run-up and maybe they'll have another 20, 30 years with the same character. Yeah. Which would be cool. And even if they don't go that way for Bond, they could still go that way mm-hmm. with early Bond if they get they get the casting right. Um, about you, do you have a theory? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I w- traditionally for the traditional Bond, I'd like to see Henry Cavill get a get a mm-hmm. chance at it. He's expressed an interest, and to me, he's got the chops to do it, both acting and action. Uh, but I, I, you know what it is? I that the whole end scene in the the bunker. Oh, one thing we didn't mention is the the single camera f- following action scene up the stairwell, that's all one shot where Bond's killing people and getting blown up, and that that was amazing anyway. Um, you've got all of the, the chemistry lab with all of these little vials, and you've got the nanobots, and you've got everybody's DNA. Are they going to clone a new Bond from his DNA with Ooh. some of his memories? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So it, it's on the island, you know, they, they, it's been blown up and this, that and the other, but what could they recover when they get there? Yeah, that's that's what I would like. In, yeah, I, I love the way you, you're thinking of using the elements of, of, of the story. Yeah. Um, so, okay, Daniel's gone, mm-hmm. but Bond isn't. Bond will be back. That's what they've said at well, the end Daniel of the film. Daniel is fine, by the way, just yeah, in case you're, you're Sorry, it. Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't cursed you or anything. Oh, but yeah, his his tenure is I'm over. Get Mrs. Craig in touch. <laughs> yeah. Talking to which? <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, his DNA is there. Mm. They've got these nanobots. They've got. I'm wondering if they could. Interesting. Yeah. Well, here's a thing for everyone. Let us know in the comments, you know, your theory, your wishes, your preference. We are also going to be looking at doing smaller, you know, shorter um, episodes called Fun With Films Extra. So maybe we should be tracking uh, the Bond, you know, kind of franchise and Bond 26, because I expect that within this, within a year, we're going to start getting some teasers. There's going to be yeah. some, some things going out there. So we could make it a regular thing where we're going to be tracking Bond. Yeah. This has been brilliant. Thank you so much. I want to slow things down a bit and move on to something that Mm -hmm. I look forward to, where you get to know more about your (gasps) co-host. I'm talking about the big question. So for this segment, without talking to each other, literally back in our respective homes, we prepare questions. So Paul doesn't know what I'm going to ask him, and I, I don't know what bit. he's going to ask me. And every time it's been, well, very surprising to say the least. Do you want to do rock, paper, scissors, see who goes first? <laughs> you learned from the last time, didn't you? <laughs> ah, you win again. All right, I'm going so first. Then. You, All right. So... I've been thinking a lot about superpowers. I'm sure you do too, Paul. All the time. All the time, thinking, what would I do? What would I do? So, talking about superpowers, but I'm also of the mind that, um, you know, we are not that lucky in life. That's that, that just the way it is, you know. So, I'm wondering what you would prefer. Superpowers, but being unlucky, the way in which you get the superpowers. Would you rather be beaten by a vampire 
or bitten by a werewolf? Werewolf. <laughs> Tell more. Absolutely no brainer, werewolf. Werewolf. Yeah, werewolf. I mean, come on, you know, every full moon you're gonna change werewolf. and lose your pants and then walk Don't up care. in the woods and be rescued by a nurse. I would be furry <laughs> and cool. I could pee up trees, I'd be smelly like a dog, I could run in wet puddles. Yes. Uh, you don't need to be a bit more well to do that. <laughs> I, I do that anyway. No, I absolutely, I love vampire war. Um, and they, they've got, they, they're a close second. They've got some real cool powers and this, that and the other. But there's something about the pure animalistic strength of a werewolf. Now, there is caveats on this. Well, is there now? Yeah, yeah, there's definite caveats. There is the fact that you don't change into a full-blown wolf. I don't like that kind of werewolf. I don't want to be a big I dog. I have younger the choice. I can yeah, say yeah, yeah. No caveats. No, no, no. If I, if I rub a Adam's lamp and I get a wish, there's caveats to every damn you wish. You don't get to so sign a contract with, I, you know, with the exclusions and stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa. On Supernatural, when you, you've you got to read the contract when you deal with the Crossroads demon, so I'm, I'm all in on that. So the werewolf, you would have to be the kind of werewolf from The Wolfman with Benicio del Toro. Okay. So big, muscular, strong, furry, actually quite cute, you know, little, little button nose, um, growly, big, long, handy teeth. Um, I would have to retain some Your level pants. of Paul okay. and control, mm -hmm. but it would be difficult, but I wouldn't go full animal and not know what I was okay. doing. A bit like um, Professor Hulk rather than Hulk Hulk. Mm -hmm. And the third caveat is I could change it will. Not just on a full moon. That's not the kind of uh, superpower stroke curse I had in mind. Yes, but it's my curse. I'm taking <laughs> it. Um, in Robert McCammon's The Wolf's Hour novel, um, if you've never read it, it would make an amazing film. He has that power. He does turn into the dog kind of wolf, but he can change at will. Um, and it's about this character during World War Two going behind enemy lines mm. to deal with the Nazi occupation and on a mission, but he's a werewolf and it's brilliant. Um, but, yep, werewolf. Okay, so I've just asked a question. The big question for, for Paul was, would you rather be beaten by a vampire and or a werewolf? And without hesitation, werewolf with lots of uh, conditions, small <laughs> prints and so on. I, I, I would I, be like, bite away, come on, do we, do we? <laughs> I, I'm kind of the opposite way. I want to be a vampire. I want that lifestyle. I want to dress nice. I want to be yeah. Lucifer. That's what I want to be. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. And have that lifestyle. Um, the fleur de lis. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't mind if I don't have to go out anymore. Uh, I've been stuck here for two years. <laughs> I, I don't mind. Just, uh, just a quick one. Um, we've got a hello from Helen Howard. So thank you very much for joining us Hi. live. And I think we've got a quick hello as well back from, from Claire. So let Anybody us know, missed. what about you? Would you rather be beaten by a werewolf like Paul with all the conditions that comes with it or a vampire? Fancy schmancy vampires. Well, with all the superpowers you get with it, that'll be, uh, that'll be amazing. All right. I'm dreading it now. What is your question well, for today? Well, it's Paul? all Bond related. Okay. Since that was our main. This is a four part question just to find out more about you and me okay who's your favorite bond girl and from which movie it's so tough it's so tough on the blackman pussy galore goldfinger Right. Only because I was for, very young. I was going to say, for I, what reason? I was a very young man watching the TV. With Hello! <laughs> and and I, I realised that I liked women a lot that day. <laughs> well, that was the day. That was literally the day. And ever since, I've been looking for one just like that. Hello! Yeah. For me, um, they're, they're all brilliant in their own mm. right, but Xenia on a top, Fam Famke Janssen oh my God, from yes. GoldenEye, she was brilliant. Absolutely. Brilliant actress, but amazing in that film. I loved her. Can bits. I quickly go away from Bond to Austin Powers? Yes. When, the, you know, he meets Alina Humpel. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was a family show. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, right, favourite Bond car? Out of them all. Oh, God, well, again, so actually, many. Actually, I've got to be honest, um, people, you know, this is about you knowing more about Pascal, thanks to Paul's question. I have no interest in cars. No, he doesn't. So, um, uh, all right, let's go for the one from uh, um, A Spy Loved Me. Let's go for the um, 
uh, what was it called again? The Lotus Esprit. The White Lotus. Yeah, which looks... Snap, that's my favourite. It goes underwater. Oh, it it's a it? submarine car. Yes. That would do so that, it. I, I, would, I just want to, you know, appear somewhere in Britain with all the you know, kind of French fishermen. And, you know, I love the, you know, when he comes out of the car and he has the fish and just drops yeah. it, you know, with the look in his eye. But, yeah, I know nothing about cars. I mean, the car didn't work. Those those old Lotuses yeah. were very, very bad. But that car, if it worked, was super cool. That's mine too. Um, favorite Bond gadget? If you had, if you were, if you were Pascal Bond and you were on a mission, what would be the gadget you would pick? I think. Um... Oh man, I'm going through all of them uh, again. Yeah, well, actually, do you know? Do you know the one? It's 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 very simple, but um, the one I still like to this day is the pen. Yeah, <laughs> not from gold. Is it golden eye? Golden eye. Well, yeah. Where Because <clears throat> uh, yeah. if you don't like somebody, you could leave the pen on their desk, hoping that one day they would click on it. Dude, yeah. you would have to have a hundred pens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's so grumpy. So <clears throat> grumpy. Um, for me, I look. I it's not the best, but I always remember live and let die. The magnetic wristwatch. Yes. Where he takes, you know, that dress down and the zipper mm. comes down, just the magnets. And I, I just thought I, that sticks with me. Okay, last one, finding out more about Pascal, especially if you were Pascal Bond. Okay. Who would have been your most feared Bond villain? The one you just don't want to tangle with again if you'd met them once in that dark alley. Going through all of them one by one from Dr. No all the way. Um, actually, the one from Live or Let Die, Dr. Somebody, not the Juju Man. From, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I don't mess with people like that. Like, <laughs> voodoo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like no voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, is, <coughs> that, that got under my skin a bit, that one when I was right. younger. So we've got Denise, so uh, sorry. He's, he wants to be a vampire. He wants to be Lestat. Live in New Orleans, but he don't mess with no voodoo. No. <laughs> Denise would love to be bitten by a vampire too. And according to um, Denise, you're very cheeky. Well. <laughs> um, for me, Jaws was obviously iconic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those teeth when I was a kid and I was watching that, I was always like, ooh. Um, odd job. Yeah. Loved odd job. But highly underrated. Nobody talks about him. Robert Carlyle's Renard. Ah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In was it Tomorrow Never Dies? He was in, yeah, or was well, it yeah. The World Is Not Enough? Maybe, mm -hmm. where basically he's an ex KGB soldier and he he's been shot in the head and it's killed mm. off mm. his ability to feel pain. Yeah, brilliant character in a not so good film, but I thought he was brilliant. In I would have loved to have seen him in more films, but you wouldn't want to tangle with the guy for sure. There we go. Right. Big question these, done and dusted. These were a good question. Thank you very much. You're so, welcome. You know the, the drill, everyone. Listen to those questions and give your answers in the comments. I've enjoyed that. But let's slow things down and let's look at 2021 from a different perspective altogether, Paul. Yes. I'd like to ask you about movies from the past that you have watched last year, Back to the Future. So, one thing about being locked down in quarantine, having COVID and being in isolation, which we know very well, is we got a chance to look back in 2021 on some films that maybe we hadn't seen for quite a while and revisit them. And we want to look at these little golden gems that either you may not have seen or may not have seen for a while. That's right. So we'll have a top three each, and then we'll be doing what we've done yes, at the moment to go and mention others as well, with your consideration. We start with this one. Oh my goodness, I've not seen this for such a long time. And uh, yeah, Did this was say? this was this was my pick. I um I remember when this first came out, I was just kind of like, what? Justin Timberlake? That's a dude from that mm. boy band and I kind of didn't want to give it a chance, and I think it was one of those times where you, you're kind of trawling around the DVD and video store, mm. and there's nothing else in because you've seen everything, and you take it, and you just go, oh my God, this film is so cool. 
And Justin Timberlake is never going to be an Oscar winning actor, but he's great in this and perfectly, yeah, yeah. perfectly acceptable for the film. Um, he did a great job. It was early in his career too, from, from, true, from yeah. an acting point of view. So the premise of the film, in the future, where people stop aging at 25, but only live one year after that. So you will forever be 25, but you only get one year after that. The currency isn't money or gold. It becomes time. So depending on what you earn is how much longer you live. So the mega, mega rich will live forever if they're 25. The very poor might not get to 26 or just after. And that's the whole premise of the film. And um, Justin Timberlake's character, Will Salas, is accused of murder. He goes on the run with a hostage and literally time is money in this film. And apart from being very inventive, it was made on a very low budget and has a quite specific, bleak look to it. It, it has a tone of maybe Equilibrium or the early Matrix mm. films. It has that kind of tone and feel to it. It just struck a chord on the morality of how we live and actually what is really important in life. Um, you know, time. You can't get it back, you can't buy it, and it, it's way more important than anything else. And how you use it is is absolutely amazing. And that really struck a chord with me. And I went back and watched this film quite recently, and it, it hasn't really aged at all because of the way it's filmed and set. That's right, you know, and as you're talking remembering, it's it's a it's a very tragic movie, actually. It's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. It's done so, so well that you're right, you end up talking about it afterwards, or in your case... Yeah. You, you go back to it, yeah. so, oh, brilliant. They, they've got the clock on mm. the forearm, and they can exchange time with each other, and the thing is, is you can't get away from it either. It's constantly running on. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, very good. Now, my kind of um, selection for, for this segment will need a little introduction, but last year was the 30th anniversary of Point Break. <laughs> Yo, dude! <laughs> and, um, oh, wow. Really. Honestly, I mean, what an achievement. I mean, when he first came out, this movie was rented out. I was working in the video store at the time, actually, and that video cassette, because, yes, that 30 years ago, was out all the time. And I used, if you watch it again 30 years later, it hasn't aged that much. It still looks no, really pristine. Apart from the actors being young. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I couldn't help but feel a little sad because Patrick Swayze is no longer with us as well. But in terms of the story, uh, and Gary Busey for, for that as well, yeah. um, the surfing sequence are great. Everything is great. The, the the kind of chase on foot that was using, you know, early, early kind of um, cameras. What do you call them again? The um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the term now. Of those cameras, you know, that you can hold and they, they yeah. don't move so much. Um, thank you very much. And uh, she's got all that going on. And again, a great achievement <laughs> by um, Catherine Bigelow. And and it it feels very nineties. And the, the, now you can watch it with a great smile on your face, thinking, "Yes, that's how we used to make movies." And that's you know, they the are great. The music's great. Mm. The editing's great. Um, the story of camaraderie and honor mm. amongst thieves, where in some ways. Thieves are more moral than everybody mm. else in it is so well done. Yeah, yeah. And for someone that uh, I spent a lot of my teenage years by the sea surfing, yeah. it has a very, very special connotation. But yeah, it's lovely. And, you know, people will, will go back to it. So if you've not seen Point Break uh, for a while, uh, I would go back to it. Don't let the fact that you were 30 years ago uh, put yeah. you off. You Again, know? it's that message as well of some things are more important than living as most people live. A bit like Nomadland. Mm, in that's a way fair, that, fair, know, yeah. They're, they're living outside of society because they choose to, and they want different things out of life. Funny that you should mention Nomadland because we, we did mention you know, Chloe Zhao being Oscar winner and Catherine Bigelow is as well. Yeah. So your uh, second choice for Back in Time is... Yes, I name-dropped oh. this earlier on, and that was yeah. quite deliberate in that. Yes, Rachel Weiss is in this as well. Um, I wish you would be in more films. She's brilliant. But this film went against the character of Constantine from the comics. He looks different. You know, in, in all intents and purposes, he's miscast. But Keanu is just amazing, as he always is. The film itself is fantastic. 
and um, when, when was it? 2005? It was directed by Francis Lawrence. Um, I went back and watched this recently, and it hasn't aged a day. Mm. The effects and the special effects look like they could have been done now. And especially the scenes where he goes back down to hell, and you've got that kind of blasted landscape that mm. looks like um, a nuclear bomb has gone off and you know, things are being torn and the, the wind is blowing. And it, it, it's, it's top notch. It's top notch now, let alone then. It hasn't aged at all. The storytelling's neat, it's unique. And, um, oh God, what's his name? Peter Storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His portrayal of the devil is so strange and unique. Mm. I've never really seen it done in that way with oh, the oil agree, yeah. dripping from his feet and the white suit and it's it's fantastic it's so much fun so well done um I love the scene as well where him and Rachel Weiss are talking and he's discussing that maybe you know the the devil and and, and God had a bit of an arrangement and it's a bit of a bet you know and they're walking down the street and all of the street lights start to shut off one by one <laughs> mm. Hey, you know something's going to happen. It's just beautiful. I, I mean, I have saw that in the movies, and I, I used to own the video cassette. I think, yeah. um, so I don't have it anymore. So thanks, for us bringing such wonderful memories. You know, please make a follow up. It's been hinted at. Yeah, that's true. Please, yeah, please, 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 please. Let's see what's happening to John. Yeah. I'm sure he'll be up for it. You know, Keanu. So. I, if you think that you know, with um, you know, Point Break, we were looking at the early early nineties. I'm going to take you late nineties with this one, <laughs> and yeah. you no, know, 1998 Blade. I remember taking Denise. We didn't want to go because I told her it was based on a graphic novel. <laughs> and you know, once we got through the uh, the nightclub scene, you know, bloodbath, when that yeah. music is kicking in and he's doing his thing. And, uh, I mean, I absolutely love going back to it. Um, some of the special effects have not aged well. You know, yes. that, that's fair to say. Well, but it you, was a very low-budget film <coughs> as well at the time. Yeah, and interestingly, the first Marvel production, um, you know, 10 years before Iron Man, can you, can you imagine? But I, I just want to see Wesley Snipes with Chris Christopherson and Stephen Dorff just, you know, actually the dialogue sometimes are even better than, than the action. Do you know what I've just realised for the very first time? As I'm talking to you, I'm looking at obviously Wesley Snipes, but I realised that behind him is Stephen Dorff. Yeah. You know, oh, it's the first time I've seen that. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this movie is delightful to, to watch. Um, there's not much you can complain about, even though once again it feels like it was made a um, long time ago. I know there's been rumours about a reboot the, yeah. um, with Wesley Snipes actually maybe taking on the role of uh, Chris Christopherson, yeah. you know, of uh, Whistler. Ali is the yeah. player, I, um, um, I, I hope they pull it off. Do you know sometimes when you have you have actors who just embody the character, you know, you've got Conan who's, you know, sorry, Arnold Schwarzenegger being Conan, yeah. um, much a moment ago, I cannot imagine anybody else doing Iron Man. Do you know what I mean? Like Robert Downey Jr. For me, Blade is where's this life. So very much like you mentioned with Constantine, it is a departure from the graphic novel. Yes. I understand that. Yeah. And the purist had been whinging, but equally as someone that necessarily uh, wedded to the, to the graphic novels, when I was sat at the cinema in Newcastle watching this, I was like, <laughs> you know, give me more, please. This was kind of like our era. Mm. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and this, this ranks alongside the crow for me. When they came out and, you know, yeah. randomly in the crown you had Wesley Snipes in Blade, it was one of the first times anything had come from the page of a comic or a novel and actually been done justice and wasn't hokey and, and badly done and tongue-in-cheek and you couldn't take it seriously. You could take both of those movies seriously mm. as character pieces, as action films, um... And, and they paved the way for the modern MCU and the modern DCU. Without these, if people hadn't appeared there, that's that's right, yeah, yeah. To support the film from the comic, you know, we wouldn't have had the interest now. We've got a quick hello from Alan Aganovich. Thank you hello. very much. And Denise says yes, Blade, one of my favourites. Well, even though she she you will you will confess that you were not yep. you know that keen to begin with. What Pascal's trying to say is you were wrong, Denise. <laughs> so final selection for you. 
The Quick and the Dead. I have never yeah. seen this. You what? I have never <gasps> seen The Quick and the Dead. Oh my lordy. What? This is um, 1995 by Sam Raimi. Wow, Sam Raimi, Sam right? Sam Raimi, yeah. Um, and you can tell. The minute you start watching it, it's got all his little filming quirks and all his camera movements that are okay. essentially his. So the story is that Sharon Stone's character, a female gunslinger, enters a quick draw gunfight in a town that is basically owned by Gene Hackman's character. He's mm -hmm. the villain of the piece. And the idea is um, that she's there to avenge her father's death. So she spent all her childhood learning to draw the gun real quick, just so she can go and get revenge for her father's death. She's brilliant in it. She's the old school kind of female heroine of the likes of Linda Hamilton, Sarah Jessica mm. and Ripley. And, you know, <clears throat> she's up against the boys and she, she you know, kicks ass. Um, she handpicked pretty much Russell Crowe for his first um, US film. And this was one of Leonardo Leonardo DiCaprio's first roles as a okay. gunfighter. Have yeah, I missed that, on, you know? <laughs> he plays Gene Hackman's son in this. Okay. So his his part is trying to please Daddy, mm. and Daddy doesn't really care. So you've got that going on. You've got Sharon Stone's character. You've got Russell Crowe as the preacher who was once a killer. Is he going to find redemption? Is he going to go back to his ways? You've got little... Um, guest appearances as gunfighters. You've got Tobit Bell from Saw. Um, Keith David is one of the gunfighters. Lance oh, Henriksen. Oh, come on. The how how Lance am I not? Henriksen. Yeah, it, it's um, Sven Ole Thorson, you know, Arnold's friend from yeah. the Running Man mm -hmm. and Conan. He plays the Swedish gunfighter, you know. Um, it's, it's brilliant and it's so well filmed by Sam Raimi. That if you like cowboy films with a little bit of quirkiness to them, um, it's brilliant. But the, the work that's went into it, apparently, um, Gene Hackman was the fastest draw. Oh, okay. Set, by mm. far. So they had a bit of a play. Yeah. I, I have no no idea how I missed it um, and not even you know come across it. I still think that Sharon Stone should have had... Uh, I'd say a better career. Maybe she's very happy, by the way, but I just feel that she should have been more present in yeah. uh, productions over the decades because I, I think she's I would say brilliant. she deserves to be, mm -hmm. for yeah, sure. Yeah. In, in this, I mean, she's at the height of her um, fame. You know, she l obviously looks stunning in it and was poured into a pair of leather trousers that apparently she couldn't sit down in. So Literally, on set, <laughs> couldn't sit down. Like a Marvel character. She had, she had to stand up. <laughs> Um, but the jacket she wears as well was a real vintage over a mm. hundred year old jacket in it. And the details that have gone into the film for what was a very low budget um, Western at the time is, is amazing. And I love everything about this film. Right. You can just I'm sold. Off and go into the old school. Excellent. And um, kind of said Jim Hackman always plays a bad in Westerns, doesn't he? I mean, yeah. it, it was the, Bad mayor, sheriff in uh, in Unforgiven, and so on. That this is great. Thank you so much. So I, I've started in your early nineties, uh, late nineties. I'm going to go uh, kind of mid two thousands with this one. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I must confess, I've never seen it. You've not that, seen that. that? Yeah, I've tried many, many times to watch it, and always something has happened. I got in the way, or I've had to go somewhere, oh. and. I've watched about the first two minutes three times, and I've never got to watch the rest of it. it uh, I mean, I, I went back to it. I mean, I love all the Pixar uh, stories and animations, but this one just feels very special. And I will say that some, the first half to me is is the best, where there's just Wally and Eva, and because after that it gets into something else. But that's that's absolutely fine, and. The, the way in which you know, the, the Pixar studios created this character is so, so charming and endearing. I mean, literally, you care, you almost tear up. For, it's not just a robot, but if, an imaginary one because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's obviously you know, animation. And the way in which they can craft you know, emotions about you know, sometimes how he's turning his eyes. And um, th there is essentially a power 
because the very first half of the story, imagine a good half hour, 45 minutes, there's no dialogues because it's just two two robots yeah. who are building a loving relationship. You know, sometimes that is <laughs> pulling at your heartstring in a way that is quite, it's quite something. And then it gets, you know, quite funny when he eventually meets humans and so on. But Wally is... Um, for me, uh, the perfect, perfect example of storytelling, story structure, uh, strong characters, and you've got to, if you can, watch it. You know, it's on Disney Plus. As you imagine now, watching it on a big TV because the detail and the texture and the depth of field and everything that, that they've created is perfect, and the humor is fantastic. So you have this um, robot Wally, who is part, is probably the left, last robot left to clear the earth of litter. And he's got this routine where he works all day by essentially ga- gathering um, a litter, compact them into little squares in his tummy, and then position them very carefully, as you've seen, you know, when you watched the beginning. But then he goes home, and home essentially is this museum of human life, and he has this old VHS cassette player playing, you know, on the loop, you know, kind of musicals, and he's imitating the humans, and he's da- you know, trying to sing and dance, and it's just joyous. And here I am. In my you know early fifties, literally tears in my eyes because a little robot is on his own on Earth, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's just brilliant. Um, so yeah, Wally. Yeah, we, we, you've got to love robots. <laughs> you know. So well, that was lovely. Uh, I need to watch it. I really do. Y- you do, and I need to watch The Quick and the Dead. Have you got a handful of other suggestions from the past that you watched um, in twenty twenty one? Right, uh, I went back and watched Pacific Rim. Yeah, right. Which is one of my absolute guilty pleasure films. I can't get sick of it. Big, big fighty robots always <laughs> do a thing with me. But Guillermo del Toro films it beautifully. We'll put mm-hmm. it that way. Mm. Yourself? So I watched A Quiet Place 1 yeah, again because yeah. I wanted to watch the sequel. Krasinski's done a great job with that. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely love it. Uh, I mentioned a few more than you can take over. Yeah, yeah. We went back to Interview with the Vampire. Roadhouse. I've got to have my yearly fix, you know. Joe's never seen Roadhouse. How is that even possible? I mean, Sam Elliott. Mm. Come on. We watched Four Weddings and Funeral again with yeah. Denise, which we enjoyed. We watched Silence of the Lambs. Yes, we, I rewatched that and Hannibal recently. Mm. Yeah. And just because we felt like it, we watched Pirates of the Caribbean as well, and so so many more. Um, but yeah, we went through a phase of just going back to the kind of nineties, early two thousands. It, it's funny that I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's we're getting to a certain age where a certain type of film or structure mm. or story, it, you know, it's hard to get out of that. Some of the, some some of the modern films may be a little bit difficult, but. I, I'm going back to so many films like that. Um, for me, Jumper, two thousand and eight. Oh, yeah, yeah. I need to go back to that. I need to go back to that. Yeah. Again, it's another type of superhero film before the worst superhero films. That's just <laughs> done in a unique way, and I didn't think much of it first time around. And one of the things I did like about it is Jamie Bell is mm. speaking in his North. Northern accent, not an, an American accent, and it, it's quite jarring when you when you when you see it back. But second or third time I've watched it, it, it still stands up, and the effects are brilliant. And the other one's a film called Armored, two thousand and nine. Oh, is that the one with um, Matt Dillon, yeah. Larry Fishburne, well done, Ed yeah. Hall, Oh, that was so clever, so clever. Car heist film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that that was real. Now smashing. Denise reminded me that we watched The Birdcage as well with Robin Williams and I know, Nathan Lane. Guilty pleasures. Uh, talk about guilty pleasures. Yeah. As soon as the, the music yeah. starts, I start to laugh. I mean, I even said anything, I start to laugh about it. And so many more. So, what about you? Last year, did you watch some kind of classics? You know, this is back in time. So, you can go back as far, well, as, as early as the movie started, obviously. But, um, you know, sometimes there's real pleasure as much as we keep looking at new movies and new kind of series on on the on the streaming services what about stuff that we watched when we were kids teenagers young adults and as you mentioned a moment ago paul so it's fascinating are you now having a different experience um because you know things yeah. you've you know you're much older that you've got a different so life experience times. yeah wow right so listen you've all been very patient listening to 
quite nice. Rabbiting yeah, on the, about the only one this bit. <laughs> the only one that so we're gonna move on to <laughs> our fun with quiz. Fun with films quiz, should I say. Uh, let's move on to this thing. Oh, so dramatic, isn't it? So, as you may have noticed, Paul and I seem to love the number three. It's all to do with trilogies, I think. So, we've got three questions each to ask you. We're going to give you a bit of time to think it through with a little surprise, and then we'll come back and get your answers. So, we'll start with you, Paul. Question number one you want to ask our lovely friends. Question number one. In 2021's The Suicide Squad... Okay. Have you seen it? Nope. Okay. I'm to Suicide Squad. Nathan Fillion, our own Mal from Firefly and mm-hmm. 18 other things. We, we love Nathan. Um, plays a hero character, well, a villain character at the beginning of the film, almost as a mini cameo. As such, his, ca- um, his name is, let's get this right, TDK. That's the name of the, the, mm-hmm. the character and the villain. What does it stand for? Right, TDK, Nathan T-D-K. Fillion, D-K. Suicide Squad. Can I just say that um, Uncharted has obviously been released in a, in a week or so. He should have been in Uncharted. Yeah. He was perfect for yeah. the role. Anyway, that's... No, you're, right, the, you're mm. right. My question is, last year, 2021, would have been, was the 50th, 5-0, 50th anniversary of a very important Steven Spielberg movie. What is the title of the movie that was made, if you can do the maths, in 1971? Your next question. Okay. In Spider-Man, No Way Home, which is arguably the biggest film of Mm. 2021, really. Um, That Bond and Duke are probably the three three biggies. Um, While... Getting suited up, mm-hmm. Spider Man on top of the taxi in a scene from No Way Home. Behind him, there's a car or a taxi with the number 1228. That has a very special meaning. What is that number? Okay, 1228. Hmm. My next question <clears throat> is about the number one surprise hit of 2021 on Netflix, Squid Game. I've never seen it yet. No. So, my question to the fans, because Paul, you're going to have to guess, how many deadly games do the contestants have to take part to win the 45.6 billion won, being the local currency in Korea? Squid Games, how many games okay. until they can get to the prize and your final question paul right um in the movie i mentioned earlier on oxygen the main lead actress oh yeah was melanie laurent Mm -hmm. french actress Mm -hmm. she was or came to prominence to fame in quentin tarantino's inglorious bastards what was the name of her character in that movie okay Lovely one. Now, my question is one which has kind of multiple bits to it. It's about Bond. Now, we do know that No Time to Die is the last movie for Daniel Craig. <clears throat> but what was the last movie, and therefore what was the title of the last movie for Sean Connery? Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, and Pierce Brosnan. And I must confess that I didn't even know the answer to my own questions. <laughs> this, is, this is a hard one. The only one I remembered yeah, was actually Piers Brosnan, so which I think is very telling in terms of um, times and so on. But yeah, No Time to Die is the last one for Donald Craig. What about all the others who played the character of Bond? So you're going to need to, time to think it through. Don't cheat, don't Google. So I've got a surprise. You're missing a Bond. Am I? Sean Connery, Roger Moore? Yeah, well, I'm not going to mention... Uh, uh, George Lazenby only yeah. did one movie. Well, so. it's still his last movie. <laughs> he was still a Bond. Come on. Okay, well, we can add that one. So at least, only because you knew you want to have one point <laughs> yeah. for the question. So to give you 
myself, Paul, and you, time to think it through. Here's a bit of a surprise for you. A great comedy from 2021. You're asleep, little breeze. Can you please wake the hell up? We are hiding in Italia Cause some people want us dead When you push me by the boobs I could hear the little boy inside of you Mommy, please don't die! I don't I think that's what I was screaming you. Let's go do what we do And blow some things up Take them to my torture chambers What? You have separate torture chambers? Mark my words The world will burn Hey, that is so fun. I had that is so much fun. The movie is so much fun. So big thank you to you know Millennium and Lionsgate and Filmspot for allowing us to use that from YouTube. So, oh, that movie is so funny. Salma Hayek is brilliant in everything, but it's clear on screen that everybody in that film is having so much fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, remind me again, your first question, okay. Paul. Nathan Fillion mm. in The Suicide Squad, his character, his villain character is called T.D.K. Yeah. What does it stand for? I have no idea because I've not seen the film, but the only thing I can think of is The Dark Knight. No. <laughs> the... <laughs> he's called the detachable kid and you see him in the trailer where he's standing on the beach with no uh, arms uh, going uh, and his arms are in front punching somebody in the head almost like an astro boy yeah his arms can come off and bite you independently of him that's gross and it's also really pathetic as a superhero power, and yeah. that's the point. It's even worse than being bitten by a werewolf. Yes. <laughs> okay, I was asking you, Paul, and all our friends, about this anniversary. So last year, 50th anniversary of a Spielberg movie, 1971. The title is? It has to be Jaws. Uh, no, it's is not. It's it not. It's not Duel. Duel? Yeah. Now, Jaws was a few years that, later. That is a good film. You know, and again, if you can get the Blu-ray, the the, the transfer they've done, yeah, you they cleaned it up, and yeah, 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 and you you could, I mean, if anyone had any doubt that this guy would go places after watching Jewel, everything they'd done, so yeah, that was the anniversary, which um, I would imagine cinemas would have wanted to do something special, but they could they couldn't because of the pandemic. Right. Question again, number two. It's a funny, funny. It's never really been. I know there's a lot of films similar, mm. but they've never remade it. So Maybe you, t- you shouldn't touch perfection. <laughs> Fair point. Um, the next film, Spider-Man, No Way Home, while suiting up um, behind Spidey in this, there's a, a car or a taxi with a number on 1228 or 1228. What is that number representative of? I don't know. Is it a, um, a code to access, you know, to go through a, a door? Is it um, a telephone number? Is it, um, I don't know. It's Stanley's birthday. Oh, is it? December the 12th, 1922. Well, it was we, a really nice way. Uh, listen, we've got Gary um, Musola, I hope I pronounced your surname properly, who within seconds of you giving the answer, wrote it yeah. down. Fair play. Uh, oh, Fair Gary. You know, respect. Is that how you do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much for joining the show as well, Gary. Um, birthday, well wow. A special. Lovely, I just love things like lovely this. Lovely way. Lovely way of saying Very much you so. Must, you're still here and we, we remember you. So when you and I, because the, the whole premise of Film with Films is to have more, you know, movie kind of uh, adventures, you and I, but we went to our first Comic-Con together with our lovely friends in London. Yeah. And you, lucky so and so, because I, I can't swear on this show, you ca- had a moment with Stan Lee. Yes, I mean, I, I mean to say, like you, you a, met a moment. Uh, no, no, we, we we had a moment. We we met eyes. <laughs> I mean, that's still one of the, <laughs> the best shot you've got because you've got it framed. I mean, that picture of you yes. and Stan Lee. Yeah, um, it, it was it was wonderful being able to just 
So, because the way Comic Con works on Visual World, though, you have to buy the tickets in advance, and I was just a bit too slow, but I didn't meet a lot of other, you know, stars. But I remember going to Comic Con is tiring, and you, yeah. know, you walk or you know you, you've got a crowd and so on. So I remember I just find a quiet corner. And I just drank a bottle of water. And as I was drinking, Stan Lee walked past with his two bodyguards. And I nearly choked. And I'm trying to say something. But by the time I managed to get recover. <laughs> so, wow. It's special moments, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. My second question was about Squid Game. That kind of 2021 hit, um, success hit in um, Netflix. How many games did they have to take part of the contestant? Uh, you'll know the premise, you know, they, they yeah. all can die one by one, so there's only one person surviving to win the 45.6 billion won. Um, how many games do you think they took part in? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't seen it. I kind of, mm. when, when things are overhyped, I don't want to kind of, I understand, I understand. Watch it. I I understand. back and, and leave it till it's, till it's settled and then go and watch it fresh. Um, how, I would have said, depend on how many episodes show there is let's say there's 10 episodes or eight episodes there's eight games that's how my mind would okay. have gone but there's more people in the trailer for it there's a lot of people so does that mean there's more games so i don't know how many games per episode oh i'm going to say three per episode i'm going to guess 10 episodes maybe 12 I'm going to say 30 games 30 games no, they took part in six games. Oh, man, I should have stuck with that. I have to tell you, they were so brutal and bloody. I couldn't cope with watching 30 games. That's just too much. <clears throat> Excuse me, everyone. But they, they did games like uh, Red, Red Light, Green Light. We used to play as kids, you know. Yeah. Um, they did one where you had to sh um, cut a honeycomb shape. They had a tug of war on top of a massive bridge. So if, if people lost, they literally fell to their death. There was a marbles game where whoever lost got shot in the head. They also had to cross a bridge um, with um, pain glass, um, glass yeah. pain, should I say. And some of them were could break and others could not break. It was just awful. And finally, the, the squid game. Yeah, it's it's one of those where, you know, give it time and go to it when yeah. you have a moment. Um, that, that'd be lovely. Your third question, Paul. Okay, the wonderful Melanie. Oh, Lamar. yeah. Oh, actually, great film she's in as well is um, Six Underground with Ryan Reynolds. Mm. From Netflix. Yeah, I saw that. Two, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yes, she was in or really rose to prominence in Quentin Tarantino's *Inglorious Bastards*. Yeah, and what was the name of her character? I don't, re I don't remember it. Uh, I, 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 Can you remember her in it? Oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. For me, actually, this one thing that I struggle the most is remembering character names. So I'll say to you, oh, Tom Cruise, blah, 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 but I couldn't tell you yeah. unless you see Ethan Hunt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Bond. Oh, Bond. So put me out of my misery then. What's yeah. she called? Can you remember the scene right at the beginning? Okay, so the, mm. the Christoph Waltz scene. It's awful. I mean, yeah. it, that's when you discover the guy, what an actor, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, so he's done what he's going to do with mm. the, 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 the French family and the girl escapes from underneath the house running across the fields and he's standing there beside him whether he's going to shoot her mm. and he just shouts Shoshana mm. Au revoir Shoshana yeah well done well uh, done it's brilliant do you know th there's that one scene with um, you know him he does it so well and then there's a scene at the coffee shop yeah oh it's just uh, incredible. All right. So my third last question, which had lots of elements to it, which was the last Bond movie. So we know Daniel Craig's last movie is No Time to Die. Mm -hmm. We know that George Lazenby's last movie is... <laughs> is it Her Majesty's Secret Service? Okay, so you've got one point. One. Now, the last movie for Sean Connery as Bond in 1983. Now, are we counting? Because there was one that was non-canon for... Was it was that diamonds? I'm. Um, yeah, I think we'll never, count. Never say never again. Never say never again. That is that one. is that your answer? If you're thinking about his version of the character, yes, mm -hmm. but that's non-canon. I think. Yeah, but that's his last movie as as the um, mm. Sean Connery. So well done. That's another point. Um, Roger Moore, which that, actually was was my first Bond at the cinema as as a um, teenager, nineteen eighty five, A View to a Kill. Oh, that was that was the first mm -hmm. screen appearance of Dolph Lundgren as well. 
Yeah, that's he's right. He's the bodyguard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't have gotten that. Yeah. I, I would have said octopus. But the only one that I remembered as I was asking myself the same questions was um, well, two actually, Timothy Dalton, Dalton and Piers Brosnan. So Timothy Dalton, 1989, was to correct. Listen, you're doing very well. Yeah, correct. That's an, another point for you. And finally, Piers Brosnan. That's easy. You gotta die another, another day. day. I love that film. I, I don't know. Are people are not so keen on it, but I just think everything works for me. It, it got silly with the special effects, mm -hmm. but I still kind of like I it. love the sword fight. Yeah. I love to go to a place like this. Yeah. Even if, you know, to, uh, that was Riddle Me This, Riddle Me That. And how also, did sadly... How did you do um, the end of this special 2021 retrospective fun with film. This is a long form video magazine. We'll be back with shorter form with other things we want to do, but once a month, um, so long as life, work, and natural events don't get in the way, um, we're going to get you know together. So we've kind of decided that we're going to try our utmost to be back with you the first Saturday of every month and looking at either a themed uh, like today or like we've done in, in the past or quite simply looking back at what's happening on the big and small screen. As well, um, please send us your suggestions or if there's any segments of the show you would like to change and put something else in instead, take something out, freshen the show up, um, but also some topics and subject matters that you want us to talk about. You know, you could say a bit of Japanese cinema for the sake of um, thinking of something. Uh, yeah, feel free, interact, talk to us. Send us a question for the next time we do a quiz. But I want to say thank you to Claire, Denise, Helen. We want to say um, thank you to Alan. We want to say a thank you to Gary and anyone who's going to be watching this on replay. I mean, this is essentially what Paul and I wanted to do because we missed each other. We missed going to the movies and, and we wished to spend hours to get on the phone about movies and one day I said to him we should recall this and it kind of grew from there so on that note uh, it's time to bring down the final curtain it's to say bye bye it's to put your popcorn in the bin or what's left of it and that's the end of this episode of fun with films till next time bye for now take care, everyone <laughs>